Welcome to the Lend Academy podcast, episode number 131. This is your host, Peter Renton, founder of Lend Academy and co-founder of Lendit. Today's episode is sponsored by LendIt USA 2018, the world's leading event in financial services innovation. It's going to be happening April 9th through 11th, 2018 at Moscone West in San Francisco. We're going to be covering blockchain, digital banking, and of course, online lending, as well as other areas of fintech. There'll be over 5,000 attendees, over 250 sponsors, and registration is now open. Just go to lendit.com slash USA to register. Today on the show, I'm delighted to welcome Levi King. He is the CEO and co-founder of NAV. Now, NAV's been around for a few years. They're an interesting company in the small business space. They're really a resource for small business owners when it comes to managing their finances. They provide all kinds of tools for that. They also provide access to credit through different lending partners, which we talk about. We also talk about the challenges when it comes to small business owners and and having them become more, more financially literate. And Levi's got some very interesting thoughts there. You know, we talk about Amazon and PayPal and and the impact that these behemoths are having on the small business space. And we also, he has has a fascinating story about how he was able to to get nav.com as a URL. It was a fascinating interview. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the podcast, Levi. Thanks. Glad to be here. Appreciate the invite. Okay, so let's just get started by giving the listeners a little bit of background about yourself and what you've done in your career up to this point. You bet. So I born and raised on a farm in rural Idaho. No, I'm just kidding. I was out way back I was where I was born, but just kidding. So I dropped out of college to start a manufacturing company. We manufactured electric signs, awnings, and neon. It's a very kind of old school type business. Did servicing work, installation work, and almost all of our customers were other small businesses. And I think I sold it when it had something like close to $3 million in, in revenues, mostly custom manufacturing and, and then the installation of those signs. Mm-hmm. That was the first of five small businesses that I owned through my 20s that were successful, and they were in different industry verticals. I owned a hotel, owned uh, franchises in the restaurant industry, retail financial services business for Spanish speakers couple others, and had a really difficult time understanding how credit and financing worked for a small business. And and then when I thought I had it figured out at the manufacturing company, I didn't realize I was going to have to learn it all over again in a different industry vertical, (laughs) but was then high risk versus low risk. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of laid the foundation to my first venture-backed business, Lendio, which is a marketplace of brokered loan options. We started that not thinking about raising venture capital back in like 2006, scaled it up to something like $9 million in revenues, and then raised venture capital to try to be a lead gen business instead of a loan broker. I won't go into the long story because it's painful and I'm trying to suppress the memories, but we made lots of mistakes. It didn't work. It eventually had to pivot back to being a loan broker, but now uh, the company's doing very well. So this my kind of my background kind of leads to, you know, how did I get where I'm at now with Nav, in that I I lacked passion for that business model because I really wanted to be able to make a difference to the outcome for the small business owner. Having been a I had been a small business owner multiple times and have plenty of war stories of, of the challenges that I had. Mm-hmm. Had gotten over 30 different commercial loans, you know, SBA equipment lease, almost every variety, and so. After watching tons and tons of businesses come through that business model that were just a little off in their credit data or their financial data, and so then they're going into a super expensive product versus an inexpensive product, I uh, I wanted to leave and build. You know, the easiest way to think about NAV is credit karma for small business. It's very, very different, but conceptually, you know, that was the idea. So that's that's been the career path now. I'm five, five years in here at NAV. Okay. So let's just dig into that a little bit. I mean, most, most uh, people know about credit karma. And you know the the sort of the credit monitoring and the the different products they offer. But what are the actual products? If you just walk us through the actual products that Nav offers. Yeah, it's a good question. From the outside looking in, a lot of people think 
Nav is substantially similar to Lendio, the, the previous company I co-founded, but the, the, at the heart of our business is credit and financial education, and that product is free. There's a, there's a version that people can pay for, but the vast majority are on the, the free version, and we, we show them their personal credit, the, the report, the score, the alerts, the associated with that. That's a, an Experian a data set we get from Experian, um, but it's housed on our server, so we're, we're technically a credit bureau uh, because we have native integrations and we house the, the data on our servers. Then we have uh, business credit data, and we also have a native integration with TransUnion on the consumer side, and we have Experian business credit data, Don Bradstreet business credit data, FICO business scores, and now business checking account data. And in the, the core, at the heart of it all is education to help you understand, improve, and, and leverage those data sets. So, so that's the core business model. You sign up, you get your personal credit. You, know, you can get your personal credit all over the place now, but we're the only place you can get it. And we speak to you through the lens of a small business owner and, and what's different about how you should manage your personal credit versus just average Joe consumer. And then if you think of, okay, on the, on the heels of education, I mentioned improve and leverage. So we've built a lot of software that's dynamic that helps the small business owner improve the various data sets so that they can move upstream and financial options over time. And then at any given time, whether their credit's good, bad, or ugly, we can, we, using the actual data and a lot of machine learning, we make recommendations for business credit cards, gas cards, business loans uh, of a, a bunch of varieties. And so they oftentimes go, go get some type of financing. So that's kind of the core business model today is the credit education and monitoring and then the ability to, to take advantage of the credit data or improve the credit data. Right. And so the, so the business model, obviously, you said everything's free, the education. I know you've got a lot of articles on your website and, and that, that's obviously all free. So, so as far as the revenue side of the business, and I see you've got, you've got like paid credit monitoring. Uh, you got a subscription business there, and you know, I imagine similar to you know, to Credit Karma, you're referring people on, and you get a revenue from you know, from the credit card companies, from the small business lenders. I imagine. So, can you just, is is that how the the business model works? Is there anything I'm missing? Uh, yeah, that's pretty good. You're missing a couple things. So the first is we on any anything business credit related, we typically win win the SEO, the, the organic search, and so we have a lot of organic traffic to our public facing marketplace. And so we have drive a lot of people just go get a business credit card and don't become a customer or mm -hmm. a business loan. Uh, so that's kind of independent to our, our logged in customer experience. So that's a revenue leg. You mentioned two of them, which is within the product, we'll make recommendations. We don't sell any data. We don't sell any leads. If the customer takes our advice and goes and gets approved and takes the financing, then we get paid. But that's not always true. There's lots of, like I mentioned, gas cards. We don't get paid anything. There's a lot of directions we'll point our customers where we don't get paid. We figure that that's our problem, not theirs, whether we're getting paid or not. We should be giving them the right recommendation regardless of whether we've figured out how to make money or not. And then the other revenue leg, and, and it's meaningful, is we carve up our, our entire user experience into pieces and deploy those into third-party applications. And so uh, people get credit education or they go get a business credit card or a business loan and never see our name or know who we are. They, they think that that's, for example, we have a, a marketplace we built for Experian. And so if you go to Experian's website, you go get a business credit card, it, it's really us powering that user experience. So, so that's the other revenue leg is kind of a enterprise SaaS type business model. Right. Okay. Got it. Okay. So then I want to talk a little bit about the, the small business owner. And I've, I, like you, I've been a small business owner my, my entire career. My father was a small business owner. And I, I obviously I know a lot of people um, who run small businesses, and you know there's varying levels of interest and education when it comes to finance. And you know there might be someone who's a a really you know a really great at their craft, and they they run it. They have they either you know sell widgets, or they or they're a, you know, they might be a great plumber or electrician or what have you. And they they have a small business, but finance is not sort of first and foremost on their mind. And I see it's, it's a really big challenge because if everyone was financially literate, uh, that there, there would be <laughs> the, the country, the, 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 these businesses would be run very differently and high cost credit wouldn't really exist. So how do you, what, what's the biggest challenge that you see with the small business owners? How do you hook them to get them interested? So we can break apart a few of those questions. So the hook that we use almost always is just 
get your credit data, understand your credit data. So it's always around understanding your credit and financial data. Mm -hmm. We don't really have hooks anywhere that are go get a loan. We, we don't want a transactional relationship with a customer. We want an ongoing relationship. Even our, you mentioned our premium product, which you call the subscription. We don't even call it that internally. It's premium content because you can just toggle back and forth between paying or not paying in our product and all of the software value is in the free, the free product. And so we don't, we don't even want to think of that as we want you to always pay us. We want it to be, we want you to pay if you see the value. If not, you're going to be a happy downgrader. So, but I think it's, so, so that's the hook usually is almost always around credit education for a small business. And then you mentioned just the business owners and if they all were educated, which I actually agree with you, if they all understood finance, they wouldn't, for the most part, ever need expensive financing and a lot more of them would stay in business. And the ones that are in business would thrive versus struggle. Mm -hmm. So the way we, our view of that is it's not a problem that you're a baker and that's your craft and that's where you spend a lot of your time. The problem is that you, you don't have enough time. It's always a time starved situation to then become educated around credit and finance. So we, right out of the gates with this business, we, we felt like business owners at the end of the, the day, they, they don't care what their Dun & Bradstreet score is. Mm -hmm. They care they can get credit with a supplier. And so we knew we had to data, showing someone their information wasn't the product. That was a hook, but the product had to be improving that data, tracking that data, and taking advantage of that data. So our, our long-term goal and uh, a big part of why we recently integrated to be able to let our customers attach the business checking account data so we can model that and educate them as a credit data set is so that we could give a lot better insight to uh, how they can make better decisions financially in their business. Every decision as a small business owner is a financial decision, every single one. And so right away, you know, we'll make recommendations if we see that they're paying for expensive financing. Well, we already sit on the, the other data that shows are they qualified for something better. So we'll call things like that out. And if you save money, there's higher likelihood that you're going to stay in business with time, once we're, we're fully at scale with millions of customers, a time will come where, you know, you've got seven months in business as a, as a pizza restaurant in Chicago, and we can tell you odds are 97% you're going to be out of business in seven months if you don't reduce your labor costs by 30%. And, and it's all, you know, the top tier of pizza restaurants use this one advertising agency, and they all spend 8% of revenues and you're spending two. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so we can give very dynamic financial advice by watching the birth and death of, of millions of small businesses. That's our, that's our end game. That's where we want to be in that scenario. And we'll, we'll get there little by little. The business owner never has to become educated around finances. They never have to be proactive. They could be entirely reactive to our proactive recommendations. Interesting. And, you know, so we've talked internally about this, this idea, do it for them. We have to problem solve as far down the path as possible, not just give them an insight. Right. So I, I don't think they're, I don't think they will ever become financially educated as a whole, but I think with technology, with products like ours, a time will come when they don't need to be. Mm, that that's really interesting because that that's where because I I've always, I sometimes get discouraged when I feel like it's just a a losing battle when you 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 see these all these small business owners just making bad choices and you know that going out of business needlessly if they just uh, if they if they are able to get a better handle on their finances so. But anyway, I, I do want to talk a little bit about the, the small business lending side of things. You know, you, like on your website, you've got I don't know how many dozens it seems like of of lenders that you that you work with. You could you just tell us a little bit about how you go about these recommendations, and um, you know, you've got obviously you've got various different filtering things you you've got there. Is this how does the process work? Are you are you trying to get data from like I'm just I'm just on your website. I haven't signed in. I haven't got an account or anything, and I see a big, you know, just a huge list of of lenders. If you've got my credit data, what how would that be different? Yeah, so I think it's worth mentioning for the framing of this. There, are, our vision is to materially decrease the death rate of small business by bringing transparency, certainty, and, and efficiency to B2B commerce and financing. Mm -hmm. We do that through our mission, which is to help small business owners build, protect, and leverage their credit data so they can build the business of their dreams with confidence. And so as we look at just this one answer within that, that framing, so we sit on a lot of data, obviously, of our customers. We sit on that data over time. We've watched tens of thousands, probably now hundreds of thousands, of interactions of one of our customers clicking out and going and pursuing some type of financing. We have a, a machine learning layer where over time, 
we, we ran this in the background for a long time before we made it a feature, but we eventually made it a feature. It's called Match Factor, where you know there's the difference between what it, the high level criteria that a lender gives to us and says, hey, this, if they look like this, we want to talk to them or we want to we want an application. We now refine that down to dozens and dozens of other points that are never disclosed. And so around business credit cards, for example, our certainty is off the charts. Like if we say you have a 97% chance, like it, it's 97%. We're not quite there on business loans because at scale, we, we have with all of our customers, personal credit data and where present business credit data, we've just barely developed the capability to collect business checking account data. Over time, though, as soon as we have that data set across a much greater scale of our customers, we'll be able to give very high confidence in all types of business loans. And then you, you can click on the, the percentage of approval and you can see exactly why you are or aren't, like why it's only 77%, what's off, what's in the gray area, so that you can then get to work on that and improve your data. So, but it's, it's to bring that transparency to, you know, this product or that product, mm -hmm. why or why not, and what can I improve? Right, right. So then I, I want to I want to go back to content because I'm I'm on your website now and, I, and there's this there's there's, there's, a, there's a ton here. You know, you've got you know credit articles and you've got your own, your own blog and you've got all these explanatory resources. So what is your approach here? Are you what I'm trying to get at is who are you writing? Are you writing this for the person who is? just a, a, like a, a small designer who's just stumbled across your site? Are you writing it for the people that you have a deep relationship with? Um, what What is your approach to, to all the content that you, that you produce? Yeah. So there's a, there's a few different teams that work on it. And so they each have a little bit different, a little bit different mandate, but you know, it, it starts with that, with advocacy and education. So what's, what is content that we can develop that will, that will, help our, our customers succeed, help them be educated. Sometimes that goes from credit and finance into other types of content, like how to have a successful meeting at your company and what are the things we've learned and where, where we failed. But ultimately it always goes, ties back to the same, to the, to the myth, the vision and mission. We want to decrease the death rate through, through education and improvement. And so now that said, there's a lot of it that, you know, you're always trying to figure out, a new or fresh way to address it. So, you know, there's a hurricane and we put out content within that lens as it relates to if you're in the middle of a disaster or if it's the political season or whatever. So we, we do try to adapt the content to what's going on mm -hmm. in the U.S. as mm -hmm. well. Right, right. And so is this, I mean, is this sort of the, the major part of your, your marketing strategy as far as you, know, you talked about organic search as being a way that people find you? Is that is that really the main way you're getting the word out or are you doing other channels as well? No, we're doing a lot of other channels that the organic grows fast all the time. It isn't just from content. A lot of that's through um, partners. We have lots of uh, CPAs. We do a webinar once a month where a CPA can get their continuing education credits by participating in the webinar. A lot of those folks sign up as a customer and then refer their customers to us that are small business owners. And most of that's, it shows up organically because there's no affiliate arrangement or anything like that. Almost, there's almost never an affiliate relationship. We have S SBDC centers all over the country that send send us lots and lots of customers. We ha we do provide affiliate links to them, not because they want to get paid. We don't pay any of them, but so that we can report back how successful people they refer are in getting financing. And so there's there's lots of avenues like that where we get organic traffic, but we also we do direct mail. We were on Facebook. We don't do a ton on SEM. And then, then there are a lot of partners that we do pay. So, uh, and, and, and other partners of other categories are some lenders that in their, their turn down, down funnel. So as they reject small businesses as a way to soften the blow to the small business owner, give them some closure and, and protect their own brand, they refer them to us for answers so that they can then get back to that lender in the future. So the, the, we have, I think it's over 800 partners now that send us traffic and we do pay them and and then hundreds more that that we don't we don't pay mm -hmm. so it's it's a very complex uh, machine it's not just content but content's an important part i right. think it's i can't remember the latest number it's around 10 percent of all signups are, are directly related to content versus something like 25 percent overall or fully organic but not necessarily just direct content right got it got it okay so 
I want to ask you about um, the likes of you know, Amazon, PayPal, Square. These are big companies that have entered small business lending in a substantial way in, in recent years. And how do you feel about these? I mean, most of them are focused just on their existing client base and the serving, serving the credit needs of, you know, of their merchants. But how do you feel about these guys entering? You think, do you think this is, uh, this is good, good for the industry? So is it good for the industry is one question. Is it good for small business owners is the other. So I, I think it's a resounding yes that it's good for small business owners. I think it can be tough on a lot of players in the industry, but I think it's good for the industry. I think I believe, or I should say I, we believe at this company that the future of the extension of credit to a consumer or small business over time will find itself happening where the data already exists or where the customer is already engaged in a transaction versus the, this moment in time underwriting that you always see when someone needs a loan, you got to pull in all this information and then there's a decision. And so those are examples of, I have a customer, I have a data set attached to that customer and I created a, an extension of credit opportunity that's fully seamless or nearly seamless where you're approved before you need the money. Obviously, the constraint is I can only see a certain type of data based on my business model, and that's constrained to people that are already my customer. I think that PayPal, I mean, I'm, I, don't, I don't know why they made the decision, but they, in acquiring Swift Capital, my guess is they hit a ceiling in what they could do there. They probably also found a ton of demand from their customers for different types of loan products that, and different loan amounts that they couldn't offer unless they had a view into credit. Mm -hmm. And so my sense is their appetite is, is much larger. And so that then becomes a bigger threat to other folks in the industry if they now acquire customers through a, the extension of credit versus making that an add-on and compete with different products. I wouldn't be a bit surprised if you see the same moves from Square and Amazon. And I think it's a matter of time until you see that type of thing showing up where there's any large install base of small business customers. I mean, Intuit's another example you didn't mention, but yep. they've got their own loan product. It's on their own balance sheet. I, I wouldn't be surprised if Google gets there. I wouldn't be surprised if cell phone carriers get there. I think for a long time, it's mostly accretive because we, we always think of, I think, I think sometimes we think of the industry a little bit to some zero and is when we see a new provider pop up. But when you have to click a button to take money, all of a sudden PayPal is competing for that loan, not just with on deck or someone else, they're competing with the savings account. They're competing with a credit card. They're competing with friends and family. Mm -hmm. They're competing with the 401k account. If all of a sudden it's that easy to take a loan, there are small business owners that will take the loan instead of tapping their personal savings account. And so I think it's very accretive overall and, and, and also brings, I feel like, validity to the entire space, independent space, that yes, that you can have a successful business model at lower rates on, on alternative data sets. How does it impact us and what, what is the future for us and our business model? Mm -hmm. So we believe as we sit on personal credit, business credit, and then checking account data and eventually other data sets, there are a whole slew of lenders now who can get to an approval or near approval based on, on the data sets that we already have. So the one-click funding scenario that you see in isolation at a PayPal or a Square, where they do have the constraint of my existing customer against the data that I already have, we in, at scale, we, we believe will be the collection of the best of the best. So instead of having a dashboard where you see high approval odds for these ones, low approval for those, but you have to click out and go apply for it. Eventually we were integrated with banks, with all, all lenders and their underwriting criteria lives and breathes in our systems. And we have a dashboard of approvals that you can click and take. And we'll be in market with that here before too long with the first lender, which we, so far as we know, will be the first example of you're approved before you apply, and that is happening outside of a captive ecosystem like a PayPal or a Square. So we think in the future that's 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 where we're headed. One click across lots of categories. Fascinating, yeah. That, that does that. that I, I agree with you. That's sort of with the, it's all about data, and if you've got enough data, you can pre-approve people and with a true pre-approval and and just have them. It's, it's talk about there's just no friction on the small business owner side. That that will change. That's that's a game changer, I think. So, I want to switch gears a little bit and just talk about your brand, Nav, and why Nav, what it means. And you know, I know you started out life as Creditera, and you rebranded a couple of years ago. So, what was what was behind the change, and and what does this brand really mean? Yeah, good, great question. So you think that on business seven. 
or whatever number it is that I would be better at picking a good name that I could stick with. But <laughs> when it's we hot. were pre-launch, there, there was a lot of security and compliance requirements that we had to go through before we could obviously house consumer credit data on our servers. And we got hit this moment where they're like, you actually have to have a URL. We actually need to know where's this going to be. And we're like, crap. So we spent a few hours, I think, with a thousand dollar budget looking for domains. And we're like, oh, it's the era of credit, Credit Terra. That'll be cool. And so we, we went ahead and got that. But it, there wasn't a lot of thought that went into it because it was for compliance purposes. We had to hurry and pick a name. You know, still, that was months before we were publicly launched. Mm -hmm. And so pick the name. Well, you'd think I would be smarter than this, like I said, but I wasn't. So there, it, it was eventually a joke in the office, like Credit Tiara, Credit, you know, Credit all these weird pronunciations of the name. So no one could remember it and spell it, which is not the type of brand you want to have. Right. And, and in addition to all that, we kind of, there's 60 something companies that have credit in their name. Mm -hmm. And we feel like we could, we didn't want to get lost in that mess. And, and then a lot of the things we've already talked about bringing in checking account data, really helping a business owner navigate. So we don't use the word navigate anywhere. It's implicit, but we want to help them navigate the life of being a small business owner, start to finish. And so we didn't want, when you, with credit in your name, you kind of get pigeonholed in someone's mind to, oh, well, you just help with credit, where we wanted help in all these other ways. Mm -hmm. So we felt like it was a brand we could build around, and guess what? People can spell and say nav pretty easily. <laughs> and on top of all that, fun fact, we had a trademark on Credit Terra, and another company was suing or threatening the patent office, and it looked like we were going to lose. So we already knew we wanted to rebrand, but it was like, okay, we have to. And I, I know the company and the CEO, you know, and I talked to him and he's like, look, man, there's no hard feelings, but we've raised a lot of money and they're like, we can't have you out there with that name. And I was like, okay, can you give me six months? And he was cool and co cooperating. And so we, then we went out and looked high and low, looked at thousands and thousands of names and went eventually hold up on an Airbnb in Santa Monica, came down with a list of 10 names, talked to some advisors and didn't think nav would be possible nav.com like a one syllable domain 20 plus years into the internet you think it's not possible and i contacted the lady who owned it and she said i'm not kidding you the, the, this is total truth what i'm about to say she said i'll just cut to the chase my my husband started a small business in i think it was 1994 called navigator communications he died a couple of years ago I had to wind down the business. We've been hit up over the years by domain brokers and all these people to sell it. I'm waiting to sell it to someone who will who will honor my husband's small business legacy. Wow. I kid you not. Wow. So I'm like, are you at a computer? <laughs> <laughs> so I had, her, I had her go to Credit Terra. I told her our vision and our mission, and I told her, I promise you, we will we will honor his legacy. And I said, and I and my budget is a hundred thousand or less. It was actually twenty five thousand or less. But I was in my head, I was thinking, I will pay personally. The rest of this to get this this brand with with this now nostalgia attached to it, and so she said, "How about ninety thousand I said, "Okay," and uh, and so that's how we came up with you know that's how we landed with Nav. Wow, that's a great story. That that uh, yeah, I was going to say cause, yeah, that how you I thought you must have paid so much for this for, the, for, that, for that name because it is such a you know it's I mean you just don't see these are million multi million dollar names that these sort of URLs these days. So. Anyway, that's great. So speaking of big names, you have a real A-list of investors that, uh, you know, Kleiner Perkins, you know, Steve Cohen's Point72, you've got Goldman Sachs, uh, you've got Chinese leaders, Tencent and Credities, who we know well. So what, I guess, just tell us a little bit about the, the fundraising process and how you, how you approach to these big names. Well, so like any honest story, there a lot of it's luck. The luck on our, in our case came from thanks to Credit Karma. Credit Karma raised their I'm going off memory, but I believe they raised their A and B rounds in 2007, 2008. Imagine the heart of the financial crisis, pitching a venture capitalist and saying, "Hey, we're going to give away credit data, incur cogs, <laughs> and make money when someone goes gets a credit card." That that had to, had to sound outlandish at the time. This is all me looking from the outside in, of course. But the, the way we benefited is all, tons and tons of investors passed. They pitched a lot of people and they pitched the, the top tier ones and they didn't raise from the top tier ones. And now the ones they raised from are, in, in my opinion, fintech household names as far as fintech investors. And by this time in 2013, when I was fundraising for our A round, 
almost everyone knew Credit Karma was for sure going to be big, right? So then I'm coming along five years later. Now, to be clear, we've taken a lot of risks. We wrote hundreds of thousands out of personal savings to get in business before we raised money. We executed, like, obviously we, we hustled and did things right, but a lot of it was luck. And so my, in my A round, there's two parts of the story I'll tell you on because it's relevant to how you ask, but it sounds rosier than the truth. I went out, got five term sheets pretty quick, had three Invesco meetings on the same day. In fact, all on Sand Hill Road with them walking distance of each other. Uh, Kleiner Perkins, the partner there, Randy Kamazar, I'd spent so much time with and just I, I could tell as a human being, he's someone I wanted to be associated with and learn from. In fact, at this point, there's no one in my life that's had more of an impact on me, probably more than, than him, except maybe my dad. And and that's personally, not just professionally, personally and professionally. And so he won the deal. And and then there was so much demand at that round that I, I kind of rolled the excess demand into an A1 round, something like a year later, bumping the valuation, terms repair pursue, no board seat. And so that was when Tencent invested Crosslink Fenway Summer. And then Experian wanted to preempt our B round. And I told them, you got to, you got to close it. That was at the beginning of 2016. I said, you got to, you got to close by, I think I said June 1st. It took a little longer, but they they led that round, and there was a few million left open in the round, but we couldn't go out and fundraise, so we were pretty quiet. That was part of the deal with them. So when we did announce it, there was a lot of other folks that we really liked, like Goldman Sachs, that were kind of expecting to get a call when we were ready to fundraise that didn't get the call, and so we ended up taking you know another round. Optics-wise, it just looks like it's a, a big B round, but taking another round and giving Goldman Sachs an observer seat, but that was with 0.72 credities. No one got the allocation they wanted, though. I think we accommodated about half of what they each wanted. So, you know, it's kind of just executing, being in the right space at the right time, and being able to to milk a little bit of Credit Karma story. I I joke that I, owe, I probably own half of my valuation, but I'm <laughs> kind of serious too. Right, right. Okay, well, we're almost out of time. Uh, before I let you go, just wanted to get some perspective on where you're taking NAV. What, what does the future hold for you guys? Yeah, so probably fundraise again next year. It could be, it'll be last money in if we wanted to, but probably not. Eventually we want, we, we intend to be international, uh, an international business. We're not going to rush that and put our U.S. business at risk, but that's an ambition. And we, you know, saying we're going to materially decrease the death rate of small businesses, it's a bold claim. There's no government agency, there's no nonprofit or private company, I think, that could, could make that claim to date. And so it's, we want to scale into millions and millions of customers and, and have a, a like measurable material impact on the death rate and the health of, of small businesses. And so that's every single day, you know, remind, remind people here, the next line of code, the next piece of sentence, the next phone call that comes in, the accumulation of millions of these little pieces over time that's going to lead to this amazing outcome. And so that's that's what we do. We put our heads down and bust our tails every day, putting the little pieces in place to get to that grand outcome. But that's that's truly our, our biggest motivation is to actually have that impact. We know if we do, we'll build a very meaningful company as well. Well, on that note, uh, we'll have to leave it there. But uh, it's a great mission, and I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Levi. See ya. So it's a really interesting thing, this uh, this whole concept about on-demand credit or credit without really having to fill out an application. I've heard, you know, we've had sessions at Lended about this. I've heard the CEOs of OnDeck and Cabbage talk about it. And, you know, Levi really talked about it there, and we also discussed it after after we stopped the re- recording. And it uh, really is the future of small business, and of consumer credit for that matter, where, you know, a company, a lender or a company like, uh, like NAV has such insight into your data that you don't ever need to go through a, a an application process. It's like, do you want this, you know, line of credit, one click, Boom! It's it's in it's it's in your account. That we are not there yet. We still have a lot of work to go before we can get there. But uh, that's the future. I think it's exciting that you know we will have you know because the whole idea about I've I've always struggled with this 
with this concept that small business owners are not finance experts and they don't want to be finance experts. And, and as Levi points out, you know, they, they shouldn't have to be. And, and I think that's going to be really exciting times when really decisions can be made intelligently in the best interest of the small business. And, and that really will help everybody. Anyway, on that note, I will sign off. I very much appreciate you listening and I will catch you next time. Bye. Today's episode was sponsored by Lindit USA 2018, the world's leading event in financial services innovation. It's happening April 9 through 11, 2018 at Moscone West in San Francisco. It's going to be the largest ever fintech event held in the Bay Area with over 5,000 attendees expected. We'll be covering online lending, blockchain, digital banking, and much more. You can find out more by going to lendit.com slash USA.